continue with chapter 8, internal forced conviction. Uh, we worked through the, through the chapter, looked at laminar flow, looked at turbulent flow. The important things to highlight in it is that for laminar flow, for fully developed, constant heat flux, the nissled number is constant, 4.36, and if it's a constant wall temperature, it is 3.66. We have to be very careful for cases where we've got a constant wall temperature because the usual way, if I say usual way of looking at the wall surface temperature and the bulk temperature then doesn't work. We need a more accurate description for the effective temperature difference and that is the lock mean temperature difference help us in that regard. Then in, for turbulent flow, there are four or five equations that you can look at and that you can use from uh, the oldest ones to the newest ones and they improve in accuracy from old to new. Uh, I've also discussed with you flow through annealy and enhanced heat transfer and there was just one more example that I wanted to do with you before we conclude uh, this chapter. And that is problem 891. Uh, let me read it to you quickly. A concentric, concentric annulus tube has an inner and outer diameter of 25 millimeters and 100 millimeters respectively. Liquid water flows at a mass flow rate of 0.05 kilograms per second through the annulus and the inlet and outlet mean temperatures are 20 degrees and 80 degrees C respectively. The inner tube wall is maintained with a constant surface temperature of 120 degrees Celsius, while the outer tube surface is insulated. Determine the length of the concentric annulus tube. Assume the flow is fully developed. Right, problem 891. Okay, schematically, got something like this, diameter of 100, sorry, 25, about 1 inch, and that is about 100 millimeters, that diameter there, and the outside, we've got some insulation, this insulation it means that the heat transfer rate from the outside wall to the environment would be equal to zero so that heat transfer rate is equal to zero this temperature there of that wall remains constant at 120 degrees Celsius and if we want to complete our sketch we can do it like this There's the inner tube, that surface temperature is 120, it's insulated here, and what we are looking at is the water. I hope you can see the blue, so that is water, and the inlet temperature of the water is 20 degrees Celsius and then it is being heated and then it will the exit temperature is equal to 80 degrees Celsius like that so the flow flows here through the annulus, through that area there. Okay. Now most probably to keep this wall temperature constant at 120 degrees Celsius, there will be something else flowing through there 
which is most probably condensation, condensation that occurs. But this is now the first step at looking at heat exchanges later on in chapter 11. We are not looking at the flow through there. So for all practical purposes, you can consider this, this as a solid rock. Okay. So there's no flow through, through there and everything flows in, in at the blue part. It is being heated to 80 degrees Celsius. Oh, and they've said that the mass flow rate is equal to 0 0.05 kilograms per second. And we have to determine the length. That is what they ask in the problem. But let's also look at the heat transfer rate. Let's also determine the heat transfer rate. We've discussed it in many cases. We always need to know if the flow is laminar or turbulent because that is going to determine the equations that we should use. You can do that by saying that the Reynolds number is equal to four times the mass flow rate divided by the viscosity pi and the diameter. And the flow is through the annulus so in this case, we would like to look at the hydraulic diameter. And the hydraulic diameter is equal to four times the cross-sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter. I'm not going to do the derivation now. We've done it with a previous lecture. But that is just equal to the diameter difference which is equal to 75 millimeters. 100 millimeters is that diameter minus the 25, 75 millimeters. Do you agree? Okay. Oh, I forgot to write down the properties. The properties we are going to determine at the bulk temperature in this case, we've got the bulk temperature is 20 plus 80 divided by 2, which is at 50 degrees Celsius. And at 50 degrees Celsius in table A15, in your textbook, you can go and get all the properties. And that is the CP is equal to 4181 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The thermal conductivity is equal to 0.644 watts per meter Kelvin. The viscosity is equal to 0.547 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter second. And the pronal number is equal to 3.55. Yep. Sorry, your second Reynolds number, your hydraulic Reynolds number is not supposed to be hydraulic diameter. I see that here. It's in meters, your Reynolds. Uh, sorry, this second. one. Is that supposed to be the hydraulic diameter? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh. I see what I wrote there. <laughs> this should be, of course, the hydraulic diameter. Okay. The hydraulic diameter. I hope some of you will notice something very important. What is wrong? Except now for the fact that I wrote the Reynolds number there. I've mentioned to you previously that you've got this very simple equation in your textbook. It saves you time in the sense that if you want to go and calculate the Reynolds number, which is equal to rho V D divided by the viscosity, you first have to go and calculate the velocity uh, and then uh, from the mass flow rate, and then you can calculate the Reynolds number. However, that is only valid for a circular tube. And in this case, we do not have a circular tube. 
Okay, so that's valid for a circular tube. So using that equation is incorrect. You can do the derivation quickly. You can say the mass flow rate is equal to rho V multiplied by the cross-sectional area through which the flow occurs. Okay, we said uh, AS. And that is equal to rho V and the cross-sectional area is equal to run out of space. Rho V and the cross-sectional area is pi divided by 4. The outside diameter minus the inside diameter. From here you can take the velocity and you can go and substitute it in into there. It's very easy. And one or two calculations later on, you'll be able to show that the Reynolds number is actually equal to uh, four times the mass flow rate divided by pi, the outside diameter plus the inside diameter divided by the viscosity. Let me write it down again. So the Reynolds number for an annulus is equal to 4 times mass flow rate divided by pi d0 plus di everything divided by the viscosity. So if you look at this Reynolds number calculation in comparison with that one, see that you're going to make an error. Okay. So that is just valid for a circular tube. And in this case, you do not have a circular tube. You have that annulus. The flow flows through that opening between the two circular objects. You see that? Right, now we can calculate the Reynolds number. It's equal to 4 times the mass flow rate. It's 0.05 divided by pi the outside diameter plus the inside diameter divided by the viscosity and the viscosity is equal to 0.547 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 and the result is a Reynolds number of 931. Okay. Reynolds number of 931. This is laminar flow. Reynolds number is smaller than 2300. The flow is laminar. <coughs> the flow is laminar. We can consider to say that we've got the case where the temperature distribution is looking something like that. Temperature as a function of x. The surface temperature remains constant at 120. The inner temperature is 20. It is being heated to a temperature of 80. So it's a constant wall temperature. Therefore, the Nusselt number is equal to 3.66. Okay. They say that we can consider the flow as being fully developed. So in terms of the Nusselt number, it's a function of x, something like that. So we know that that value is 3.66. Once it is fully developed, if it's developing, then it is higher. However, again you have to be careful. I keep on leading you into traps. I'm talking now lots of nonsense. Okay. Again, it's an annulus. It is not a circular tube. 
for a circular tube, there's that table that I've that I've mentioned with a previous lecture that I showed to you, table 8.4, and that is the table that you need to use for an annulus. And the table is in terms of different diameter ratios for the Nusselt number inside and the Nusselt number outside. Okay. Lots of different, well not lot, I think uh, about five or ten values are given in your textbook. The one that is most important now for us is this one, 0.25. So the inside diameter is 25, the outside diameter is 100, so it is 0.25, that diameter ratio. And then that result number is 7.37, and this one is 4.23. What is the difference between those two values? Take note, that doesn't mean the Nusselt inside is the Nusselt number on the inside of the tube. That is not what it means. Those are for the annulus. So if that is the annulus, like that, Nusselt inside is if there's heat transfer on the inside wall. Nusselt outside is if there's heat transfer on the outside wall. Now in this case, the outside has some insulation. That is why we've said that the heat transfer rate over the outside wall is equal to zero. So therefore, we are looking for this value, which is that value. You see? So it means the Nusselt number on the inside wall is equal to 7.37. That is where the heat transfer occurs. Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the hydraulic diameter divided by K is equal to 7.37. would like to determine the heat transfer coefficient. The hydraulic diameter is 75 millimeters divided by the thermal conductivity which is 0.644 is equal to 7.37 from which we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient as 63.28 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. When we've got this type of case, we've said that there are two things which are important, and that is the so-called NTUs, the number of transfer units, and the fact that we should use the LMTD. Okay, the NTUs, the number of transfer units, number of transfer units is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate Cp. which is equal to the heat transfer rate multiplied by the surface area over which the heat transfer occurs. So the surface area over which heat transfer occurs is that surface, the perimeter, multiplied by the length. The perimeter is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length divided by the mass flow rate Cp. We've got a little bit of a problem because we can put in all the values but we do not have L. L has been asked. We have to determine it. So in terms of the original equation which says that the outlet temperature is equal to the surface temperature minus the surface temperature minus the outlet temperature, 
of E to the minus the transfer coefficient pi dl divided by the mass flow rate Cp, or the number of transfer units. Everything is known except the length. So outlet temperature is 80 minus uh, is equal to uh, the surface temperature is 120. 120 minus the outlet temperature is 80. E to the minus the heat transfer coefficient is 63.28 multiplied by pi, the hydraulic diameter is 75. We would like to determine the length L divided by the mass flow rate 0.05 multiplied by CP4181 and from which we can determine the length as 38.5 meters. Thirty-eight point five meters. That is the length, and that length will then assure that the outlet temperature will 80, be eighty degrees Celsius if the water flows in at twenty degrees Celsius. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions? Okay, we are not finished with the problem because. I've also added another part, which is to determine the heat transfer rate. Now yes, if you think of the heat transfer rate, then because I've said so many times that we have to use the LMTD, you think of that equation, and it is correct. But in many cases, there's an easier solution in front of your eyes. And that is just to say that the, the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by the Cp multiplied by the temperature difference, the inlet and the outlet. <coughs> the mass flow rate is equal to 0.05. The Cp value is 4181. The outlet temperature is... 80 degrees, the inlet temperature is 20, and that gives us an answer of 12,540 watts. I would like to ask three or four or five of you to tell me how far do you stay from the campus? How far do you stay? Mm. Five kilometers, right. And you, sir? One kilometer, and you? Also five. Also five, okay, I'm not going to use five again. This, you don't have a clue. Okay, how long do you travel? You walk 30 minutes. Okay, so 400 meters? <laughs> you said you walk 30 minutes? Okay, about 3 kilometers. And you, sir? 7. Okay. Now, take note. All of you, all of you gave me answers of only one digit. Okay, so that's not an engineering answer. <laughs> you understand that? So that's why I always say that is, even if you say 12.5 kilowatts, is extremely accurate. <laughs> the answer is 13 kilowatts. It's like somebody staying 13 kilometers from campus. We all know what you're talking about. But you definitely do not stay 12,540 meters from campus. <laughs> that might be true, but it's usually not of importance. The fact is you stay 13 kilometers from campus. So always remember that you have to start moving to engineering answers and do not ask me how many digits do you have to give in the test and exams. 
yes, in your calculations, you obviously need to carry it over to ensure that you've got the right answer. Right, so that's now an easy way in the test of the exam if I've asked you to, to determine the heat transfer rate. And maybe you will not have enough time, but in case you have time, it's always safe to go and make sure if you can get the same answer with the other approach. So let's see. To be able to do that, we need to calculate the LMTD. Okay? And remember how easy it is. You look at the temperature difference at the inlet. Let's do it like this. We write 120 there and 120 there. What is that temperature difference? That temperature difference is 100. You agree? It's 100 minus this temperature difference, 120 minus 80, is 40. It's 100 minus 40 divided by the lin of the first term divided by the second term. And that is equal to 85 degrees Celsius. Do you agree with that? I was hope you will not agree with me. Okay. Again, what I also would like to ask you always is try to think before the time approximately what the answer should be. So there we've got a difference of 100 and here we've got 40. So you would like to have an answer of in between. Uh, my example was not a good example. Let's suppose you calculate it as 185. <laughs> okay. If you calculate it as 185, you must immediately know that it can't be. Very easy to make a calculation error. Okay. So that should actually be 65.48. Should be between the 40 and the 100. Can't be less than 40, it can't be more than 100. Now we can go and check the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area of the heat transfer multiplied by the delta T, the LMTD. The heat transfer coefficient is 63.28. The surface area over which the heat transfer occurs is this area here, so it's the perimeter multiplied by the length. Okay. So it is equal to pi multiplied by 0.025 multiplied by the LMTD 65.48 and fortunately the answer works out as 12.534 which is 13 kilowatt or if you really want to be accurate 12.5 kilowatts. Okay. Right. Do you understand? Okay, now we are at the end of this chapter. And for those of you who were busy on your cell phones, you should have received an announcement by now, uh, a few minutes ago. And that announcement says that with this chapter, ending of this chapter, there are five more problems which are available on YouTube. One year I was away on a sabbatical and I could only do the theory part and I was sitting there in a hotel room somewhere on a big piece of yellow paper and I wrote out five problems for you. It would not be a good, I would not recommend it that you go to the tests or, and all the exams without going through those five videos. Okay, so it's five additional videos. I'm working through it step by step, explaining to you all these different scenarios. Okay? So that is the end of this chapter. Now, uh, I'm, I'm usually very confused by uh, where we are in a semester. 
But uh, my understanding is next Monday when you're supposed to write test on this chapter, it's uh, holidays, am I right? Well, there are no classes. Okay. And then on that Friday or that weekend, you start with a test week. Yeah. So it will not be possible to write a test on this chapter, but it will then, of course, be covered in the... It will not be possible to write a class test, but it will be covered in the test. Okay? Right. Let's continue now with chapter 9. And chapter 9... is on natural convection. Chapter 9 is on natural convection. Just going back to chapters specifically 7 and 8. What did we do in chapters 7 and 8? We've looked at external convection and now internal convection. With all of them, in terms of possible relationships, most of it was written as the Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds number, Pranel number, and then I've mentioned to you previously the grass of number. And the grass of number was not taken into consideration with this. So those are, in, that is what happened in chapters 7 and 8. In chapter 9, things is going to change now. In chapter 9, we are going to have relationships, which is a function of Reynolds, Pranel and Grassoff, and a second group, Reynolds, Pranel, Grassoff, And it's the same thing that I've written there, I know, but there are two different categories. The first category that we're going to look at is that the Reynolds number is not going to play a role at all. Where do we get problems like this? These are problems where there are no pumps, no fans, etc. So the flow is not forced over a surface. And or you can say that the Reynolds numbers are extremely small. The velocities are very, very small. So in this type of problem is normally where there are no pumps, no fans, but the Nusselt number is a function of Pranel number and Grassoff number. And then the last category is going to be a category which are known as combined natural convection natural convection and forced convection okay so nc is natural convection fc is forced convection and like everything we're going to start here making things simple and once we've mastered that then we're going to look at where all of these effects get together. So, paragraph 9.1 is on the physical mechanism of natural convection. And in terms of applications of natural convection and where natural convection occurs, those are typically in elect many electrical equipment. Many of it has a fan these days, but I'm talking of equipment who do not have fans. Uh, power transistors, TVs, DVDs, electrical baseboards, etc. Uh, steam radiators in, in some buildings, not really in South Africa, because it's not so cold here. Next to all the walls, they've got all these things which are being heated. They've got hot water circulating through it, but there's no fans. So that's an application, that's an application of natural convection. Uh, many refrigera refrigerated coils on the outside, they've got that wire there with all the tubes, but there's no fan again. So another example of natural convection. And uh, then all of you are 
getting your heat transfer as you're sitting here is because of natural convection. Yes, um, air is being blown into, into this venue, but if you go and measure it next to your body, it is almost negligible, and even, and even if we put it off, the heat transfer from you to the environment will be from natural convection. So the mechanism is the easiest to, to explain with an egg, an egg lying, a hot egg lying on a surface. What will happen? Well, this surface is going to heat the air molecules close to it. And if the air molecule is being heated, its density decrease. If its density decrease, then it goes up. So you've got something like that. You've got the flow that starts doing like something like that. And if you go and follow it carefully, then you'll see the flow patterns does something like that. So around and close to the it, to the egg. If you look at a small control volume, you've already done it in physics. Then you would look at the buoyancy force, and, you, and there will be two forces which plays a role. Firstly, the mass of the control volume or the body, and then there will also be the buoyancy force. And the buoyancy force is equal to rho multiplied by its volume multiplied by gravity. You've done that in physics. And also a little bit in fluid mechanics. The opposite is now where you open a, a beer can, and if you hold it here in the air, like that, so this is cold, and it's colder than that of the environment, then the flow is going to do the opposite. Something like that, around it, streamlines, you can go and solve it in detail in CFD. However, remember, people always refer to that and say this happens because heat rises. Heat doesn't rise. Okay? It's the air that rises because the density changes. The density decreases and the force in imbalance then causes it to move up. Now there's a part in the textbook where Again, you do the example of a ship, and uh, there's the volume of it. And maybe it's a steamship or something like that. And then you can go and calculate the net force, which is equal to the weight minus the body force. The weight will, of course, be the total weight of the ship and its passengers, everything. The buoyancy force has to do with the displacement of the water. I'm not going to go through the derivation, but the result is you can write it as the density S. Now, let's suppose it's a steel ship. Okay, steel ship. Density of the material, the density of the fluid, seawater maybe, multiplied by the volume and multiply it by G. So the very important thing to see is that if G is equal to zero, then there will be no natural convection. Natural convection cannot occur. So the heat transfer will only be by conduction. Will only be by conduction. Again, if you now go and look at this equation, you do a few calculations, and again, it's given in your textbook, I'm not going to work through it, but what is now important is a so-called beta, which is the volume expansion coefficient. 
the volume expansion coefficient the volume expansion coefficient it can be defined and that volume expansion coefficient is equal to beta it's equal to 1 divided by the kinematic viscosity the viscosity dt at a constant pressure and that is equal to I'm not going to write down a long story there and it ends with equation 9.5 so that is how you can get the value of beta however for most cases or for many different fluids in the tables at the, the back of your textbook where you get the density and the CP value etc they give the value of beta also so it's also in your textbook there is an exception and that is in cases like air or helium I do not think that the values of beta for them are in your textbook but if you work through this derivation you can actually then show that beta for an ideal gas is equal to 1 by the temperature however be careful this temperature is in Kelvin it is not in degrees Celsius now these velocities around bodies because of natural convection can be solved with CFD but there's also some instruments that you can use and that is called an interferometer and here on the on the powerpoint um, okay if you can just focus on that part of it Carl so there you can see uh, typical photographs that can be taken and those are typically lines of constant density lines of constant temperature the sketch on your left hand side there you can see the flow is laminar and as and on the right hand side the flow is turbulent of nature so those things were used before the time of CFD to determine how the flow field would look around objects and of course more complicated objects than that of a flat plate right now in terms of paragraph 9.2 the equation of motion or then the equation of the gas of number I've given you that equation previously and just refer to it but let's just see where it comes from and how we're going to use it in this course right now it starts with looking at flow over a flat plate and there's no forced convection it is natural convection only so this plate is being heated to a temperature Ts and we've got the environment temperature which is T infinite okay now because of the heating on the leading edge and then just thereafter all the decreases in density will then cause a buoyancy force next to the surface and what we get is a boundary layer developing like that again a velocity boundary layer but it is different now in the sense that the velocity boundary layer is going to develop like that but where previously this maximum value is that of the free stream velocity it must be equal to zero because the air far away from the flat plate is not moving there's not natural convection there so the velocity distribution must do something like that so that is the velocity distribution there let me use it let me do it in blue because blue previously we have used for the velocity distribution so this is the velocity distribution like that 
And if we now look at the temperature distribution, how is the temperature distribution going to look like? At the same, at the same point there, I'm not going to, yeah, let, me, let me rather put it in here. So if this temperature is higher than that of the environment, then that temperature is going to do something like that, and it is going to decrease to a value there. Remember, it's not vectors, but this distance is an indication of the temperature, like that. So that is how the temperature distribution is going to look at. Now again, what we can do is, like previously, we're going to look at a control volume, and we are going to look at the forces, the shear stress on this side, the pressure on this, uh, this side. So here, the tau plus d tau dy multiplied by the y, etc. So that would, of course, be a distance dx, and that would be a distance dy. And we can go through this derivation using the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions which are different now is if y is equal to 0, then u is equal to 0, the velocity is equal to 0, and the temperature is equal to Ts. And that is by putting the x and the y Mm. Well, the x is now in that direction and the y is there. That was the notation that was used. And then when y is equal see, far away, then the velocity is equal to zero, the velocity is equal to zero, and the temperature is equal to T infinite, that of the environment. So the result of that, using that, and then also we have to do to non-dimensionalize the equations, and if you can zoom in there on the left for us, um, Carl, then you can see that is the, the part of the derivation, there it follows, and then you get all the non-dimensionalized values, and then you end up with the equation of the Grassoff number. So that is where the Grassoff number comes from. The Grassoff number is equal to g, gravity, which is multiplied by beta, the thermal expansion coefficient, multiplied by t is minus t infinite. The characteristic length to the third divided by the kinematic viscosity. Now the most difficult part of getting the Grassoff number is the characteristic length. Okay. So this L, we can put the C there to indicate it is based on a characteristic length. And there's not one rule that you can always use. Again, the secret is going to be in the fine print. So the secret is you need to read very carefully your textbook to determine how you should get the characteristic length. And I will continue with the next lecture, focusing on that and also giving an example. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's the end.